Thank you, everyone, for being here, and Marcia and Phil, and to the Carnegie. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I had a very distressing end of the year and beginning of the new year in the death of my son and my husband. And I'd like to start my reading by reading a poem by Gal or part of a poem by Galway Canal um, in honor of Barry, my son. His wife, Tammy, and his daughter, Erin, are here tonight. And um, Barry and Erin used to play tennis all the time. So this is a Galway Canal poem about tennis. <laughs> I better get my program out so I know what I'm doing. <laughs> On the tennis court at night, for Barry, I'm reading it. We step out on the green rectangle in moonlight. The lines glow, which for many have been the only lines of justice. We remember the thousand erased trajectories of the close contested last set, blur of volleys, soft arcs of drop shoes, L huge ingrown loops of lobs with topspin that went running away, cross currents recurring down each sweet and bitter. The breeze has carried them off, but we still hear the mutters, cries of deuce or love too, squeak of tennis shoes, grunt of overreaching, all dozen extant teams, ten, I'm sorry, tennis quips, just out, or about right for you, or want to change partners, and bah of sheep, translated very occasionally into funk of well-hit ball among the pure right angles and unhesitating lines of this arena where every man grows old, pursuing that repertoire of perfect shoes, darkness already in his strokes. So that's Galway Canal. I think I have everything here. Um, one of the things that my husband, who passed away on New Year's Day, loved was making pottery. So I'm going to read a poem called Dreaming of the Potter that I wrote for her. Nocturnal goblets spin easy in dreams. Raw porcelain takes shape in naked simplicity. Water pools rinse skillful fingers Toes control wheel speed. Palms caress hollow earthen breasts. Spiritual, this making of vases, this molding of bowls, this sanding of bisque-fired clay. Gone the chaos of the world. Dreamer becomes vessel, skin smoothed and dressed in glaze. Um, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about my husband and I. We met in the fifth grade, and we went all through elementary and high school together. And after he graduated high school, he went into the Air Force and ended up, when he left the Air Force, in California and went to SC, where he met his wife named Judy and had two children, Paul and Julie. Meanwhile, I went to college to become an elementary school teacher. 
found my first husband, Harry, who um, 12 years later died of leukemia. But uh, we produced three wonderful sons, <laughs> Bill, Jim, and Barry. And um, one year, about five years after that, Herb came out to, Cal to New Jersey, where I was still living, and was learning a business that he started from his brother. It was a durable medical equipment business where they delivered wheelchairs and oxygen to people's homes. And during that time, we remet and started dating. And we actually fell in love, and he proposed marriage, but it meant moving out to California, uprooting my family and moving out. Um, but when I moved out, I got a wonderful gift. His ex-wife befriended me so that we were able to join our families together. So I'd like to read a poem that I wrote for Judy, his ex-wife. It's called, You Are the Mother. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> You are the mother. I meet you as you sit in your car with the window open. I bend down and say, hi, Judy. You greet me with a big smile. I'm relieved. I'm the new stepmother. It is the 70s. You invite me to your consciousness raising group. <laughs> I learn a whole lot about my new husband, Herb, and my stepchildren, <laughs> Paul and Julie. I don't tell Herb everything. <laughs> Paul is graduating from Santa Monica High. You say, let's do the graduation together. We have a big celebration out on our deck. Later, I invite you to Christmas dinner. You come. You invite Herb and me to your wedding, a second Herb. We go. <laughs> we go to my, uh, I'm sorry, we go. I say to my husband on the way home, this marriage is not going to last. It didn't. <laughs> Judy, you moved to Eureka. You, we tell you we're taking a trip with our parents to Oregon. You say, use my house as a home base. I'll be away at a conference. We do. <laughs> you find Mary. We can't make the wedding, but we meet your third husband when, when you guys drive down from Eureka. He's a doll. <laughs> They're still married, by the way. <laughs> Fast forward to 2014, your granddaughter Monica, the helicopter pilot, is, the light isn't too good here, is um, graduating from Cal State Long Beach. We all meet at Paul's condo in San Pedro. After the ceremony, everyone goes to dinner. Judy, you choose, you choose to sit next to me. So that was a true gift. One of the things that my husband loved was cooking and baking. And he liked to learn from his mother, Ella, who was Hungarian and uh, an excellent baker. So I'd like to read a poem called Making Strudel. This is for Herb. I was not there, but I can imagine your, his mother guiding him in the ritual of passing on knowledge. He raises dough from a bowl, carries it to the long wood table. His fingers curve as he works 
the soft flower ball. You'd think his hands and the dough were wed, the way they move in a delirium of love. He flowers a board and rolls a translucent sheet, thin as the skin on a wrist, where gray veins remind us of our delicacy, being forever on the verge of death. He'll bend as the light fades, sprinkle cinnamon, which will melt and spread like dark blood on tissue white dough. The oven warms, and he sees the pastry mirror himself. It must be tender, perfect. So Herb and I used to like to go to poetry readings together. And, <laughs> and this uh, poem came after we had been to a reading by Cecilia Wallach. OK, let me see what OK. It's called Celia's Poetry Book. We carry her book to bed with us, take turns reading poem after poem aloud, trying to echo her tone in words pressed forever to Esparto paper leaves until a Santa Ana wind takes the dried, dried grass fields with fire and her poems rise up in late flame, then curl like blackened and spent rose petals, page by page becoming the ash that we all will when man decides to destroy man in the way we now know how, in one large blast, big enough, I imagine, to scare the remaining planets into submission. <laughs> Okay, and speaking of fires and the devastation that just took place recently in Ventura, um, and also Malibu has had their share of disastrous fires as well. So um, this was written after a big fire in Malibu. It's called, Your Back Grew Large for Herb. Your back so large, it held back the mud, held back hunks of wall and roof sliding down, the mud sliding over us, all the houses leveled, bits of stick and grass. We picked each other clean like arboreal gibbons, uncovered our nakedness, your front, your tender front. Okay, now Herb liked to write poetry as well as go to poetry readings. So I want to close my reading with a poem that Herb wrote when Herb and I, in the 80s, went to England for three months as study abroad students, and we were with all the young college students, and we had a wonderful time, but one of the classes we had was a writing class, and this is what he wrote in that class. It's called Dictionary. I started this assignment at home and I was going to sketch a few notes about an idea that was being birthed. I needed to use a dictionary to look up the spelling of disappear, as I always confuse myself concerning two S's or two P's. <laughs> Ellen had our dictionary, and it wasn't very convenient to go and get it, so I picked up our house mum's daughter's copy of the new little Oxford Dictionary, which happened to be on the desk. 
Looking through the D's, I was suddenly hypnotized by a word in bold print at the head of the last column, denoting that it was the last word on the page. Demi semi quaver. <laughs> Musical note equal to half a semi quaver. I was intrigued. This was my first experience with a British dictionary. <laughs> so far it made sense, but I didn't know what a semi-quaver was. <laughs> Off to the S's. Semi-quaver. Musical note equal to half a quaver. <laughs> Makes sense to me. The British seem to be true to form. Tell you the part you already know first and leave the rest for later. Off to the cues. Quaver. Musical note equal to half a crotchet. <laughs> like I said, everyone knows that. Off to, <laughs> off to the seas. Crotchet. Musical black headed note with stem equal to half a minimum. <laughs> Foiled again. Off to the M's. Minimum. Musical note, half as long as a semibrev. Now, if you think a semibrev is equal to half a brev, you might be right. <laughs> Off to the S's. Wrong. Semibrev. Musical longest note in common use. But it doesn't seem right that a semi-anything should be the longest. <laughs> it's, it seems that it should be half of something. Right, you guessed it. Off to the bees. Brev. Musical note equal to two semi-brevs. <laughs> See? I knew a semi-brev had to be half of something. So if a brev is twice a semibrev, then a semibrev can't be the longest. I'm certain, had this been a Cambridge dictionary rather than an Oxford dictionary, it would have been much clearer. <laughs> I think now that I won't look up that word I was having trouble with and just disappear. 